Hello everyone, welcome to the 10th European Lisp Symposium. It's, it's indeed a quite special year this year because Lisp is turning 60, although technically speaking, I believe the, the name was only mentioned for the first time in 58. But Lisp is turning 60 and the symposium is turning 10. And believe me, when I say to you that I, I have a hard time realizing that we've been doing it for 10 years. I remember the, the first occurrence at uh, the library in Bonn, which also, by the way, is my native town. The first occurrence of the symposium with Robert, and uh, I can remember it like, like it was yesterday. It's just amazing. And the, the work actually started uh, even earlier than that, because uh, this Pascal, uh, where is Pascal? Yeah, from that? <coughs> no, not here. Okay, so, yeah. <laughs> Pascal and Charlotte. <laughs> Uh, they actually started this, this whole adventure with uh, not the European LISP Symposium, but the European LISP Workshop <coughs> back in the days, and that was probably something like 20 years ago. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's touching to, to see you all attending uh, every time, every single time. <laughs> and we've come a long way since the first occurrence of the symposium, because now I believe that we have, in average, uh, between 70 and 90 participants, which is great. I think this year we just totally blew the number of submissions, which is also great. And for the, the second year in a row, we have the ACM in cooperation with Status, which is also great. And we have to thank Irene for that. Where is Irene? Happy anniversary. And uh, so uh, many things are in order. First, Alberto, uh, our program chair this year, thank you very much for. Uh, working on Symposium this year. I hope you you enjoyed working on it as much as we enjoyed watching you work on it. <laughs> here, as I said, uh, I would like also to thank our local organizers. That was a relief for me this year because most of the logistics were was handled by the, the programming conference itself. So thank you for the local organization. Thanks to our sponsors. You keep us going every year. Uh, so some of you You've been sponsors, regular sponsors, right from the beginning, which, which is really cool for us. Uh, without you, I don't think it would be possible. And of course, thanks to you for attending every year as well. It seems that we cannot find a way to make you stop from attending. And please continue doing so. Uh, I have a, a couple of quick announcements to, to make before uh, actually going into the, the talks. Uh, in terms of student refund, uh, as you know, uh, because of the collocation this year, um, the student fee actually doubled, which was unexpected, but we've managed to organize a refund of 50 euros for every student attending both days of the symposium, so as to, to get back to the usual uh, student fee you're used to. So the only thing I will ask you to do for the students, you know yourself basically, is to sign this form on, on today and tomorrow as well, just to attest your presence. And then don't forget, as I said on the mailing list, uh, to send me your banking coordinates so that, uh, so that I can refund you after the, when the symposium is over. Uh, lightning talks. Uh, there is one slot left. Only one, so if, if somebody wants to give a lightning talk and, uh, and, and you know, tell me about this, uh, the first one, well, we're going to use the first come, first serve algorithm, basically. If you have a PDF for the lightning talks, please uh, send them to me by email. I will try to finalize today's schedule by noon, uh, and I will um, uh, give the, the, the actual uh, organization on the mailing list later on. Uh, that's it for the lightning talks. Um, we have a new website. Thank you, Nicholas Hafner. A round of applause for him. <laughs> it's our 10th anniversary present from Nicholas. Hopefully this website is going to be uh, much more readable, uh, uh, specifically in mobile devices, I think, and also hopefully uh, more easily maintainable for us. So thank you very much for, for this. Uh, there is going to be a nice logo exhibition uh, from Michel Varda. Where, where is Michel? Show yourself. Yes, he's here. A round of applause for him as well. <laughs> we have a, a very nice set of uh, 
logos based on the original list logo. Uh, the exhibition will Sorry? be in. Yeah. Not, not the original list logo. Uh, the original well, is yeah. uh, these the red, uh, red letters, and this is uh, one of the, fan, uh, the community made logos. Remix by me. Okay, Remix by me. Okay. So the exhibition is going to be installed uh, probably around noon upstairs where, where the coffee break uh, takes place. It's not installed yet, but it's going to be uh, installed there. Uh, one last thing, but I, I will uh, let uh, Dick Gabriel give a word about Danny Boro, who passed away a couple of weeks ago. So I wish I could be here talking about uh, this program that I work on. I work at IBM Research and I do all my programming on LISP. But uh, instead I found out that uh, two weeks ago today, Danny Barro passed away somewhat suddenly. Uh, he was 82 years old. Um, he was a, a very big name in a bunch of different areas. AI, of course. Uh, he worked on natural language. He worked on uh, knowledge representation. He also worked on the 10x operating system, which ran on the PDP-10s. He was a student of Marvin Minsky, so it's a time in the past. Uh, his PhD thesis was on a program called Student that would take uh, word problems, simple word problems, uh, such as an elementary school student would solve them. Would solve them. Uh, after that, he worked on Interlisp and did a lot of work in Interlisp for quite a while. He worked at EBN, both Brannock and Newman. Then he eventually made his way to Xerox Park, uh, where he worked with a lot of different people uh, that, we, that we sort of know. Uh, he, uh, he worked on a uh, thing called Loops, this, op this object-oriented programming system. Common loops, which was a transportation of that to the just being uh, designed common list. And then I worked with him for about two or three years on the common list object system. And that was Danny, me, uh, that woman, Linda Dinekel, uh, David Moon, Gregor Gonzalez, and Daniel Weinreb, who also passed away a few, few years back. Um, after that, uh, he went back into some natural language work, and I believe his last published paper was in November of last year. He was working on big data stuff for, for healthcare and things like that. So I'd like us to take a few minutes to just sort of sit quietly and remember him. He's one of the greats in our area, kind of a renaissance man. He was a mentor to me and to lots of people. He was a very kind human. Uh, he wanted to help students and, and his colleagues his whole life. to do it, I, I not only was honored, but I was also very happy because I had a chance to 
participate in one of these symposiums. And I have to say I was impressed with uh, the number and the quality of the submissions that we received. Uh, actually, the hardest part of my task was to decide which papers to leave out, and it was a difficult choice. So, um, everything else, thanks to the great help I got from PPA and Yuan and the members of the um, and the reviewers, was was actually very easy. So this was a very valuable experience, and I hope the whole symposium will be also for you. Again, we have a great program. Um, I don't want to sound like Donald Trump, but it's really great. Um, it's uh, it's going to be very uh, intense um, because again we try to include as many papers as possible. And we also have to work through it with the constraints of the schedule of the main programming conference, which means that uh, again session will be uh, pretty full. Uh, on the other hand, we have several long coffee breaks, so I encourage you to take advantage of them to interact with the speakers in case you don't have time to ask questions during the regular session. So we're also going to eat into a little bit of the social events for uh, lightning talks today and tomorrow. Um, hope you don't mind that. Um, we hope there's going to be enough time to uh, socialize and take part in this. And so again, thank you everybody for, for attending, all the authors for submitting their uh, um, papers, uh, everybody who helped with the organization, both from the ELS and the programming conference. And at this point I'd like to introduce the first keynote speaker, Hans Hubner. Uh, Hans has been a professional programmer for uh, 30 years. Uh, he has worked with a um, wide range of programming languages, spent 10 years working intensively with uh, Common Lisp, and now he um, owns a software company, specializes in the use of closure for uh, applications in the healthcare field. And today he's going to talk to us about identity in the world of values, inspiration software systems, and the closure world. Okay?
getting them from one form, data from one format into another. Um, we often have to interact with libraries written in other languages, and uh, the interaction with Java uh, libraries was was uh, really hooked me uh, into Clojure because of the easy interaction that you can have. Also, I have basically switched from a uh, object-oriented programming style in common is to a more data-oriented style and uh, that is well supported in Clojure so um, that was kind of the reason why I'm, I'm, I wouldn't consider myself to be a full-time common list programmer anymore. So this talk is about persistence um, and persistence uh, to me is um, or to many I would say is how to um, make sure that your data is uh, still there when you restart your program. And uh, program restarting uh, is really uh, adding a lot of incidental complexity to your, uh, well, for my applications at least, in the sense that uh, I uh, suddenly have to think uh, about time and about um, data that my programming language cannot directly manipulate. So, my programming language, and this is true for both Common Lisp and for Clojure and for C++ and for any other language I have used, um, secondary storage is not subject of my language environment. So I, I manipulate things on the stack or on the heap or wherever it is, but uh, when it comes to disk I.O. or to disks in particular, uh, or SSDs nowadays, uh, I need to go out of my programming language environment and into the system environment and that's creating quite some headache because it requires me to think about um, serialization and uh, about maybe transactions um, and I wonder what this is coming for, from. So um, one thing to think about is time, so time is not really well reflected in any of the programming languages I have used. Um, so, everything is considered to be happening instantaneously and there is no direct reflection of time in the, in, the, in the language, which also means that if you restart your program, your program doesn't really know that it's been restarted. But then there is also this um, notion of space, which um, uh, has an effect on how we think about persisting data today, because um, when our languages were created, Lisp and any other language I know, um, we were forced with, uh, to think about uh, constraints in terms of space. So early systems had kilobytes uh, of working space and when you had uh, to manipulate data that was more than a few kilobytes, you had to think about getting it out of that memory that you could directly operate on. Um, and, well, here you have core memory and just so core memory is one of these technologies which is very limited. So, <clears throat> but um, the, the, the fact that um, the working memory, the memory that your programming language can operate on is limited, um, also drove how we think about persisting data uh, over time and uh, I think it's also a source of the complexities that we have, have been dealing with or that I've been dealing with. So, the other um, thing that I would like to point out is that talking about persistence also often means thinking about um, data models. So some languages, some programming languages give you tools to model your data in terms of strokes or plus classes or records and closure. Uh, and some don't, some allow you to express relationships between data, data some, some others don't, but um, databases are really just that. Databases are devices that help you thinking and modeling your data, and this is one of the reasons why many people, when thinking about uh, persistence, uh, think about, oh, I need a database. So they want to write a program, and then they think about the data, and then the next thing is, okay, let me think about the data layout now, and then I write a program that transforms the data in the database. So, it's adding force and complexity. So, one of the ideas that, that I've been growing up with is that 
it would be great to have a unified language, language environment where you can model your program, your dynamic behavior, and your data layout in the same environment. So, and well, I'm, as I said, I'm, I'm a 1980s person, and we were growing up, growing up with object orientation. That was the unified modeling language. And one of the propositions of the unified modeling language was that you have a graphical language that you can communicate to your users with about the data that you're operating on, and maybe also some, some behavior, and that you had a round-trip system where you can write, do something in your graphical environment and then write real programmer code and then go back to the, to the modeling environment. And that was kind of the dream. Um, this this round-trip thing really didn't take off in, in small environments, big and bigger, so I, I, I'm only working in small environments. But from the perspective of Lisp, we can certainly meld and mold Lisp into anything that we want to, so we can just make it a database description system too. So for that, in Cumulus, we have the class, uh, the, the mock, basically. The mock allows us to do that kind of thing, and I, <coughs> I have a, a history in that, in that I tried this. I will, I will have a slide on that. So another thing, another aspect of this is that um, when you think about changing the state of your system, you also want to make sure that the changes are consistent and transactions are a way to do, uh, to think about that or to model that. So, what are transactions? Transactions are state changes that are uh, done in an atomic fashion. And one thing that you can do is use transactions to um, completely describe the changes in the state of your system um, in a linear fashion. So you do one thing, then you do the next thing. And when you repeat all these state changes in transactions on a certain begin state, you will always yield the same end state. Um, so what you can then do is, when you have this system that has transactions and where you can repeat transactions, you can lock the transactions to stable storage to, to a disk or SSD or whatever it is. And um, just by, re well, when you restart your system and then repeat the operations that you did um, to yield a certain state, um, you can uh, basically restore the same state from, from stable storage to a new start. Um, and this is what we did in the EKNA data store, which is this clause-based persistent system, persistence system that I've written together with uh, Manuel Odendahl in well, 10 years ago or something. So what we have here is a transaction system that logs, and then we added code to class that uh, tracks changes to slots, so that every slot change is done within a transaction, uh, and then we added more subsystems, and this is kind of a system that we've used for uh, a bunch of, well, commercial customer applications. One of them is still running. Uh, and I've seen that uh, work for other people too. And the, the, the thing that, that made this work well for, for me as an object-oriented programmer was that I have had objects, and each object had a state. I had transactions that I could uh, used to monitor state changes, and objects kind of had identity or actually have identity so that um, I can identify every instance of a class over time after restarts and they still stay the same. Now this is kind of what object orientation gave me, the thinking that an object is a good unit to represent state and identity, to store it to disk, to restore it from disk. That was my work. Now, at some point I stopped working in a very object-oriented fashion because the very fact that I had to um, specify all the objects in a very clear fashion and say, okay, this is a bank account and it has a 
name associated and the current balance and whatever it is, so that I had to make up my mind about the, the layout of the data in advance while, while when writing the program. <coughs> kind of um, disturbed me because many of the problems that I was working on were more of uh, an ad hoc fashion, it would work in an ad hoc fashion. So I, I read some data and I knew it had some fields. I was only interested in one, two or three, or three of the fields. And the rest of the data I just wanted to load and then maybe later write some code that, that acted upon them. So this is how I got dragged into Clojure. And then the other aspect is the interoperability aspect. And then the concurrency story of uh, Clojure is also great because it does never mutates your data. You always have values that you can easily compare and pass around. So. So this is kind of what, what drew me there. And as I said, object orientation, that was my world before. You have this complected value identity thing, which is an object which makes it easy to, to, to reason about external entities that, that change over time. But then you have this equality problem. You have two objects. Are they the same? Well, I, if they are the same in the sense that they want the same external entity, it's easy, but then if you go by value, or you have all these equality predicates, are they a problem? Mostly no, but then maybe they are, to me. Um, so, modeling real-world entities as object is straightforward, but if you have to deal with a lot of values that you really operate on basically just by is it six or seven, can you add them, can you, can you compare them, then object orientation doesn't really have that same appeal. Um, and it really, I mean, it's, it's not a constant thing. Some applications are very easily identifiable as being well suited to object oriented uh, approaches, others are not. And well, for example, adding values is not the, the thing. So if you have a values-based system, you only have one equality predicate, and that's what, what closure really has. It has equals. So two things are equal if they are equal field value. And it does that recursively, and it does that uh, in a very easy fashion. You never have to think about you have a nested truck structure, and then suddenly in, in commonness you could have an object in between, and if you compare the whole thing with, with equal p, uh, you don't know whether the right thing is being done. In closure, you don't have that problem. And that makes concurrency also straightforward because, uh, well, it doesn't make it, but uh, it is also straightforward because of this uh, approach that if you have something, it never changes, you can pass it around. You, you, you can rely on a function argument not, not to be, be modified in the process, all that kind of thing. So, even though Clojure does have mutability and you can use it, it's not there by default and your whole thinking as a Clojure programmer should be that your expectation is um, nothing is mutated. But where does this, does this lead when it comes to um, storing state? And one, one, of the, one of the very popular ways to deal with, um, with persistence or with systems that have to store something in the closure world is uh, in web applications, where you have a CRUD application which has an URL and you want to retrieve a, a certain resource or you want to create a certain resource. So at the boundary, you get a request from some client, and then you go through a, some middleware that identifies what it is that you are talking about, and it loads the stuff, always oh, a read. Then it calls your pure function, the pure function returns something, and that is then printed to stable storage before it's returned to the client. And that's a very simple approach to, to, uh, to modeling your persistence. You just push it to the borders, and it's it's kind of natural to a list program, I would say, because it's like read print. You, you read the stuff from the request, you print it again easy enough. However, this only works for smaller worlds, and only if your, your boundaries can easily identify the whole world that you want to operate on, because maybe it's, it's the name of the bank account or whatever it is. But when you have more involved logic that needs to 
spread, uh, well, to, to search for things or to, to dynamically determine what is it that is being addressed, then this architecture is not really um, easy to work with. And then also, because, well, it's not easy to work with because then you have to push this, determine what it is that I'm working on to the border, and then you call your pure function, and then you spit, spit it out again. And then the other thing is when your well, it's not very, very tiny, uh, but a relatively large data structure, let's say a hundred things, but nested, then if you want to return the whole world here, so that you can print the new state, or that you can do whatever you need to do to persist the changes, um, it becomes really, really unwieldy to operate with these nested data structures. And that's something that I find not so nice. So it works for small things, it doesn't work well for bigger things. So what I thought about was what, what is it that, that stops me from doing the same thing in closure that I could do in common list where I have the optic system. And I came to the, well, thought that uh, an object really is an identity plus some value that is an, uh, associated with that identity at a certain point in time. And that's, that's really how I wanted to approach this in closure. Um, is it maybe too long? I also hear it. Um, so, um, closure has something, well, I, I talked about values, so closure has values, but it also has references. And references are um, closure's uh, mechanism uh, how uh, mutability and mutable state can be uh, implemented in the scope of the software transactional memory system that it has. And STM is uh, the ACI of ACID in the sense that uh, uh, it provides for atomicity, so you open a transaction and then you make, make a few changes to references, and the outside world, all other, other threads, only see these changes when you commit successfully. Uh, and it's also consistent in that you uh, always see a consist well, this is uh, consistency. I, I'm not going to go deep into that because it's a kind of deviated thing, but anyway, isolation is clear, so the other threads don't see what you do other, uh, unless you fully commit your whole state. And <coughs> STM transactions in Clover uh, guarantee this, these ACI properties uh, with res uh, respect to changes to references and a reference points to a certain value. So what I uh, 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 try to do is represent the identity of an, uh, an entity with uh, a ref, so that I can have many refs and a consistent state of these uh, refs with um, respect to current time. Now, <clears throat> what's missing is the D in asset, uh, durability. and. What I found out is that one of the clever design decisions of uh, Richiki in Clojure is that um, there are agents and agents interoperate with um, STM transactions in a certain way. The certain way is, um, well, first, an agent. An agent is an agent, maybe you have heard about agent-based systems, you have, some, you have some flow of control that is independent of other, others and, uh, for example, in uh, in Ellen, you have these um, processes which have a message queue, and every every agent is self-contained in that it only operates on its own data uh, in an independent fashion, and you send messages to it. Now, Clojure has reactive agents in that, uh, and this is kind of uh, different in the sense that there is no waiting for a message, but you call the agent, you send it, you send it a function invocation, which is then invoked inside of the agent. And the agent has a state again, and what the function returns becomes the new state of the agent. But this is more or less a implementation detail, but the good thing about agents with respect to STM transactions is that when you send messages to agents from within a STM transaction, 
um, the messages are only sent when you successfully commit because um, STM transactions, you can have two of them, and if there are conflicts, one, if, one of them is, uh, is restarted and the other one succeeds. Now, if your transaction is restarted because of a conflict in your reference updates, uh, then the messages that, that have been sent uh, in, in your transaction code are not sent to the agent, are not actually delivered to the agent, and this allows for easy implementation of a log, because you can have these two threads, both of them send messages to the logging agent, which persists the, 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 the uh, transactions to a log that you can then roll forward. Um, and um, uh, by the way, of this, what I just described, um, this transaction safety, you, you only see the changes in the log that, um, that are successful and in the right order. So, how does it look in code? Refs. And as you are mostly common SP developers, it will be looking very foreign with all these, I mean, these, blah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not that bad. So, uh, well, a ref, what, so, so, with this, well, persistent refs are refs that are persistent in the sense that they have an external ID. So, whenever a new ref, which is called pref, is created, uh, an ID is allocated here, alter, blah, 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 that's part of, part of total structures. So, so I allocate a new ID and put that into this ref here. This is the ID of that ref. And the ref also follows the, uh, the ID of a deref protocol, which, which uh, is used in the, in the surface syntax to be easily recognizable. So, so you can create refs, refs get an ID, you can set them within a transaction and you can alter them within the transaction. You cannot change refs outside of the transaction. Then the next thing is defining transactions. And um, a transaction is defined with devtx and devtx is designed to be the same as defn or defn. Uh, in Clojure it's called defn, in common it's defn. You want to be different for the fun. <laughs> so it's, they took the fun of <laughs> So, and one, one of the new things in Clojure is spec. So, one of, I mean, some of you may have written uh, def fun like macros, and writing def fun like macros is not as easy as uh, 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 if you want to do it right because you have to deal with the doc string and you have to properly parse the lambda list and blah 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 blah. So there is a certain amount of complexity to parsing something that looks like a defun. Uh, with Clojure, it's even harder because uh, Clojure not only has uh, doc strings, it also has meta information that you can add, uh, add to your functions and uh, it also it supports multiple arities by the way of how uh, the JVM supports multiple arities so you can have a, a one arity and an n arity function and a, 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 a signature for the same function which is called by the same name but this makes uh, uh, creating defn without the u like uh, macros are uh, relatively hard because then you have to look is it uh, multiple arities and all that so and spec comes to the rescue spec for those you who haven't heard is a new system in uh, closure a new subsystem if you will that allows you to uh, 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 formulate schema so so you can describe the shape of your data and code is data as we know uh, in in um, in a declarative fashion, and all these s slash things uh, um, symbols are part of the spec system, which does that. And one of the things that you can do is describe the shape of a defn, which is done with this uh, in this defn arcs section. One criticism of uh, spec certainly is that it has a global namespace and that you put stuff into this global namespace and you need to regularly register. However, um, uh, the good thing is uh, you can write a spec, and I st stole it from someone uh, that describes def, uh, and then you can easily write a def tx macro that uh, understands a lot of the def syntax, and that's kind of nice. And 
what I what, what this marker does, it, it extracts the signature, well, it's boilerplate basically, and then it wraps the bodies of the function of the of the transaction into wrap transaction. And wrap transaction that we look at it is doing the magic with figuring well with writing out the the function arguments into the log. And well you can conform the arguments and that gives you a representation of the arguments and then you could can put them back together so that they look like a defin and constant and, and go with it. That's kind of cute. Transaction model. So, um, one thing that I observed when I'm working with Clojure is that many of the things that I've uh, uh, come to uh, take as granted in common list, for example, a reader and a printer that is well defined, even if it's con convoluted, it's very well defined and you can really, well, easily figure out what doesn't work. Or, well, you, no, you, no so, sorry, you can easily think that it can do everything and then fail because it wasn't designed for it. But reading printing in, in common list is very, very straightforward and with, with you can you can and well defined and you can do a lot of things. And when I wrote this initial this EKNR data store, uh, I, I came to think that it must be that easy in any of this. In enclosure it's not quite that easy. However, um, uh, it's also not very hard, but you have to define a, uh, to, to bind a print up variable so that instead of the normal printing routines, print up is invoked and that's never really documented, and then you can put in a function into invocation into your log. And, and that's, I mean, it's, it's not hard, but it's, um, I found it surprisingly uh, uh, unintuitive to, to, to figure out how this works. And then this is the wrap transaction function, which gets wrapped around all the bodies in AFTX, which does the actual logging. Uh, and it, well, one thing that you want to avoid is if you have a transaction function that calls another transaction function, that this second invocation, second call to a transaction function function is locked because you don't need that. If you capture the outermost transaction, you always capture the, what's going on inside because your transactions depend on on the arguments only. Um, so, so we bind uh, a lot of transactions to false when we, when we invoke the actual body, and then at, when the body has been evaluated, we log the transaction by sending log transaction, which is the other function that we looked at, uh, to the agent. Um, and because agents are asynchronous, we also want to wait for the, the logging to have happened, so we in the, in the we create a promise here and wait for it here. DREF waits for this promise to be fulfilled. <clears throat> and then restoring is very easy, straightforward. We uh, again we don't need to log them. We invoke all the transaction functions here, so so we can log transactions, set a find log transactions to false, and then we just reload the file mostly. Nothing, nothing very special. And then at the end for your application program, it looks like this. FTX, that's just a standard function. Instead of alter, we use p-alter because we deal with persistent references here. Um, get account just gets an account from this persistent reference which stores all the accounts. And then here you have something like transfer from an account to an, another account with an amount. And that's just that just looks like normal code. And that's really the goal of it. The goal, well, maybe I was not clear about it, but the goal is uh, to write your persistent code so that it looks uh, mostly like normal, non-persistent code. So, well, yes, I have mostly in, uh, reinvented objects in a bad way, maybe. Uh, um, but, um, yes, I mean, maybe that's what's needed to do that. Um, what I found is that the uh, reader and printer are, of closure, are a bit quirky. Uh, if you want to pretty, pretty print your persistent references, then you need to implement this method, uh, which is never documented, and all these kinds of things where you really, I mean, I found it really hard to, to find out what's the essence and how it works, because it's unspecified and sometimes even changes. So that was kind of uh, funny, and, and I wanted also to, to uh, uh, briefly show that spec, which is a spec for uh, this spec, that defines the, uh, the argument list of a definite. Which 
looks like this. So it's a name, a doc string, which is optional. It's meta information, which is optional. And then it's either alt, either it's one, it only has one RT, so it's args plus body, so it's argument plus body, or it's n RT, it has multiple RTs, and then it's a concatenation of bodies, each of which have an args and body, so you can see that it's just repeated. And that's a dis description of, of the syntax, and that's quite nice. I mean, the, the, even though, well, if you conform this against a given, in, uh, given set of arguments, uh, you get an error message, and it is a technical error message. It contains keyword symbols, and it's not totally, it's not, you are the user, and I'm very friendly to you, but, but it is a precise description of where the actual, the, the, the data that you provided to the spec and the spec differ and what the spec wants. And that's really, really kind of nice because it's very precise and certainly much better than, than doing this in a manual fashion and providing these error messages in an error fashion. This is always complete and that's, that's nice. Also, what I've been thinking about a lot in the recent, uh, uh, in the preparation of this talk is uh, that the stack is really an important thing for me, and that this might or might not be the right thing, um, but uh, to me it is. So here, this binding creates a binding on the stack. And um, so if I call one of these transaction functions from within another, I cannot just parallelize the whole thing onto multiple threads because then I'm losing my stack. And this is something that that closure isn't very friendly about because it has lazy uh, evaluation if you want it and it has pmap which is a parallel map that where you don't see that multiple threads are created but they are so so threads are really going on underneath in certain places and they lose the step so with common list i'm really i'm really a, a fan of the stack because of and uh, uh, because of dynamic variables. And this is really something which is in, in myself, in my thinking, and, and the fact that closure doesn't really make the loss of a stack and the, the threading uh, very explicit, um, I think it's a problem. To me, it's a problem. So, my questions are, maybe programming languages are not proper uh, data modeling languages, uh, and maybe it needs to be that way. Um, and maybe then projecting what you have as data into a ephemeral model that you operate on and then losing it again, maybe that's the right way to go. Um, I'm not sure about it, but, um, and, and my programs, I mean, when I write a program, then no, when I write a program that operates on certain set of data, then yes, then this is the right way. So, so it's, not, it's not one or the other, it's, it's a continuum. And then what I really don't know is whether the tendency in closure to rip everything apart into small components that you can then assemble however you like is really uh, a good way to deal with abstraction. I mean, abstraction really always means that there is some leaky things and some something goes away and you get something something bigger, bigger to reason about. And in closure, I, I see the tendency to to always put it to the to the most small to the small smallest part that you can find. And that's I, I'm not sure whether that's overall the the best way to to go with this, but maybe it's it is. I mean, it's it's in, in the same sense. Uh, that CL is a multi-paradigm language. Um, closure is a, well, multi-paradigm thing in the sense that it just doesn't prescribe a lot of things. Um, and that's it. That's what I have.
We have it. We just need to 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 get it commercialized. I mean, we can get a terabyte of RAM, so we can get a, a maybe maybe hundred gigabytes of uh, magneto resistance or something. So the technologies exist. It is just that um, the the whole industry is so so bound to the ways how it does things. Oh, we only have this little bit of RAM and we need to take care of it and then put it to the disk. That's stupid. I mean, I think it's stupid, but I don't know when it will end. So I've recently seen talk about basically a similar thing. And what they did, like in the 80s or something, they just treated the whole operating system or operating system as like persisting continuously on a log, log based storage basically, so that would kind of go that way. But I think, I think it might be easier to solve the problem also like performance wise if you just start like a normal level. Maybe, maybe you are talking about Eumel Ilan, where the, yeah it's, it's from the 80s, it, it's, it's one of the first systems that Jochen Lieke worked on, uh, who is then who got kind of famous uh, through L3 and L4. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, uh, usage modes was, I heard, I was, I was a kid then, but with one of the other, they had this financial application, and then if you were a programmer and you screwed up, you had 10 minutes to the next step, snapshot. So switch off the machine, I'm sorry, you lost your 10 minutes, and that, that was, I mean, that, 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 that was the way to go. And, and there is research in that, in that field, so of course, uh, there are single address based operating systems, and uh, and uh, orthogonal persistent operating systems, we had that. I mean, the research was there in the 80s, but it, <coughs> as you said, it was in the 80s, and we still need to dig it into our world. Any other questions? So, closure is a, is a, is a, is a trendy language at the moment. There was a closure conference in my city last weekend, and I went down and lots and lots of these. Uh, Hipster programmers there doing uh, doing closure. Um, you, you don't strike me as a kind of hipster programmer, and you can see that you're very comfortable with uh, with, with closure with some aspects of it in the end. But why don't you just start out with uh, staying staying at home in in, in say ABCL on, on the Java platform? And and do you regret uh, not having done that? No, I don't regret. I mean, I can hire hipster programmers. <laughs> And try that with common list. I mean, and, and no, I mean you can hire common list programmers, but it is hard. And um, uh, to us, uh, in the last two years, just having a closure job just gave us the resumes of people who who are beyond Ruby. And and if we had had a common list job, we would probably get gotten resumes of older people who are not as flexible. So we had some people actually go to Berlin. It's just just a hiring device. And, and I'm sorry to say that. It's, it's, it's to, and and I'm, I'm also inclined to say that, that we are not terribly happy with the hipster programs. So, so hiring smart, well, hipsters, old people, well, the, the, the intersection of people who are can do work together is, is not defined by do they want to do closure or are they hipsters or whatever they are? So, so it's more of that. And I, I actually I, I enjoy learning new languages, so, so to me it's, it's just exploration. I have a question. Since you're in the commercial world, I was wondering if you could give us some um, just a general idea of the kind of applications that motivate your work, the kind of things that you're developing that require what you just presented. Well, what I just presented was really. Uh, 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 just research, in the sense I wanted to figure out how could I do what I did in common list in Clojure. And this is not really directly used in what, what we do at Lambda we, we do uh, uh, healthcare data processing in a very, I mean, that's, it's, it's, it's totally boring if it wasn't uh, Clojure or common list or whatever it is. So, so it's just about the tools and not so much about the, the, the content. Will find a way of using all this eventually now that it's developed. 
yes, but but it, it always depends on 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 the system. So so uh, incremental transaction logging is something that you that that, that is useful for. Uh, longer running server processes uh, where you have the freedom to store the data any way you want. And, and, and um, when, when we want to use this, we use this. I'm, I'm not really, I wouldn't really say that, that uh, the, closure, the closure thing that I presented here is something that um, I, I'm going to use in our company because we're using a commercial XML database mostly, so something else. I just quickly comment that uh, SQL is a way of uh, modeling and thinking about data. And, and therefore, and then I think with the tools like uh, ORM mappers and stuff like that, and we build on top of SQL. I just wonder, uh, what are some of your inspirations outside of, of SQL for tools or stuff or ways of thinking about data? Because the examples you gave seem fairly, uh, I'm looking at it, I didn't totally understand closure and familiarity. I'm looking at a, a like a depth struct with some special properties that I gotta pay attention to. Yeah. That's kind of, if that's unfair, please correct me. No, that's that's totally it. Okay. So the tools or different ways of thinking that you've gone on this exploration for well, years or inspirations that you think might be interesting to check out if we have more time or <coughs> Well, with, um, you, have, you you mentioned ORMs and, and uh, one of the things of ORMs is that they are projection tools. Well, they, they will often uh, often I see applications that that uh, start off as we use an RM uh, and don't think about persistence, as you said, record with some special uh, properties, uh, and then someone else starts using the same schema with without the ORM level, and then, then that's where you end up uh, getting getting into the mess, because because someone else depends on your schema, you cannot change it anymore the way you like. So, so ORM is really um, this this um, kind of projection, automated pro projection thing where you end up in, in, in disorder. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm not. I, I don't. I, I'm, I'm. Well, the thing that I'm really interested in is modeling within my language environment, and that's that's within the language. Within yes. the language. So one thing that that, for example, would be uh, inspirational maybe is Gemstone. Uh, Gemstone is a database system that is uh, written in Smalltalk and uh, that uses Smalltalk as its modeling environment, and then it it just persists Smalltalk objects. That's pretty nice. Yeah, there's a follow-up then. What do you think of RDF? And I guess the thing is there, it's always external to the language firm. and ways of dealing with these models and so forth. Did you look at, because there's a lot of work there about, well, at least type mapping and stuff. It's not in the language. Just, yeah, and, 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 and our, well, work, well, sorry that we are going into the dialogue here, but uh, uh, one thing that, that, that I think is true for RDF in particular is that it's really projection. So, so you have data, and, and uh, um, if you use REF, then you use it correctly. If you put anything in, and then only later decide what is what is your entity, and that's fine. But it's 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 a different perspective than writing a program and thinking about what does it need to persist. Of course, you can persist your data in triples. That's that's not not a big deal. However, that's not what I would consider to be RDF. RDF is like uh, anyone can say anything about anything. So, so you can just in, throw in facts and then later determine what it is. And, and but it has this ad, ad hoc quality. Yeah. Not, not for parity, right? yeah. but it has, I can throw my data there and I'll make the scheme up later and all of it together is efficient. Yeah. yeah. It's just not always easy to do. Yeah, that's true. So, first comment, uh, spec kind of cites RDF as a prior art. Uh, if you read Rich Hickey's rationale for it. Um, but also, I wanted to know if the communication to the logger agent is happening on a queue or a async channel. Uh, it's, it's implicit in send. So it's queued by closure. And, and I don't worry about it. But as you, as you mentioned prior art, uh, most, well, of course, what I pr presented is not novelty. Uh, and also what Clojure has is mostly not novelty. There is very little, uh, very few things have not been done uh, or research already that we do today. So, so most of it can be found in 80s and 90s papers. And it's really just about 
transporting it into the new world. And what, what Closure does often is, uh, or what Rich does is, look at something from the 90s, give it a more fancy name, or get, use one of the names that has been used back then, and say it two, three, fifty times, and suddenly everybody thinks he has been uh, uh, invented transducers, which is not true, because they have been in series. Series have transducers. And, and, and that's, I mean, that's just a, a sales technique. <laughs> I don't have that. Any more questions? 